Hello. Hopefully we're live back once again. Hello and welcome back to yet another episode of Green and White brought to you by Argyle Life. Queen's Park Rangers were the latest visitors to the Theatre of Greens and leave Home Park with only a point closer to safety after Sam Field initially had Marty Sifuentes' side ahead. Argyle do, however, have their first goal at home in 559 minutes of football, if you're counting it, as Albert Adoma rescues a point for the Greens, bouncing one in off his knee. But if you're pedantic like me and you're counting Mikel Miller's finish against Coventry City also as an own goal, then it's 584 minutes since an Argyle player notched at home. But enough of the negatives. Joining me tonight are oh, with one short, he's missing. The Sam Down gag cannot be made. Um, we're hoping to be joined by Dan Ellard at some point. Uh, Joe Bell, how's things? Yeah, good, mate. Um, we'll try and keep up with the uh, positives for at least the next 90 seconds or so, I suppose. Mm. We'll try and keep this nice and short if we can. I'll, t- um, I'll tell you what is a positive. What is a positive is that lovely Argo Life Green and White podcast jumper you're sporting there. Oh, it is. It is, isn't it? It is. Uh, and and, that, and that, that mug. Oh, there's a mug. Yeah, there's a mug as well. Uh, you can get those in the Argyle Life shop, if you will. We didn't even plan that, to be fair. So thanks, Jay. Uh, appreciate that. And Finley Allen, how's things? Hello. Yeah, all good, thank you. Are you coming live from Cardiff tonight? I'm not, no. I'm, I'm oh. back next week. Um, so I'm in Plymouth still. So I'll be at the game on Friday as well. Oh, I thought you were going to be our local correspondent tonight for the <laughs> updates in South Wales. I'm sure... Um, if anything happens, you will see me do the Ayatollah at least. Um, but as it stands, the results look okay. We, we wouldn't mind a, um, we wouldn't mind Hull losing really. But we'll get on to that anyway. Joe, you like to talk a lot. Why don't you uh, run us through that one-one draw with QPR? I, I won't be doing an Ayatollah um, or whatever it is. Um, talk us through the one-one draw with um, QPR. So. It's a bit of a funny one, this really. I don't, I still don't quite know what to make of it. Obviously, you know, I do have a slightly different view to the one that you lads would have seen in the in the group chat last night. I think, um, if you said to us after the change in the dugout where we were going to go from one drastic style to revert back to the system we were playing, it was never going to be a um seamless process it was never going to be a, a an easy watch all the time and you know we we got fortunate on on friday i think we all know that i say we got fortunate look we we came up against a, a league one a league one team and we we dispatched them as as best we could um without putting the four or five past them perhaps we deserved um and we always knew deep down that this was going to be a tougher game um and it proved to be look qpr uh, i think of all the teams that are in and around us in the division i think qpr are the standout team of that lot i think they're i agree with what john Allsop said and i'm going to quote him a little bit they're grotesquely out of position um in relation to the championship i think i remarked in the first half that it was very similar set up to what west brom deployed against us um just obviously not quite as they not quite as talented in midfield but they flood the midfield and they make it very hard for you then to control the game and I'm not totally sure that we had any real form of overall control in that first half I think it was a very even first half um the start to the second half was then completely and utterly bonkers um, it turned into a basketball game for 10, 12, 15 minutes. Um, you know, anything you can do, we can try and do better. Oh, wait, no, we can't because we're in the relegation fight. Um, and then it sort of settled down a little bit. We we made the couple of changes and we, we really took a, a little bit longer to adapt to these changes, I think, on this occasion. Um, QPR get a goal that, frankly, is really disappointing, I think. Um, and it goes back to what I said after the Bristol City game, that perhaps it was a case of um, their attacker wanted it more than our defender at the set piece. Um, you know, Michael Cooper makes an unbelievable save um, to get a hand on it. And then, you know, Lyndon Dykes does does very well to keep it alive. And, and Sorinola obviously 
doesn't get his clearance right and you know we then just watch it go into the roof of the net so that's frustrating but then you come on to a little bit of a positive and the fact of the matter is that we we found a way to get back into the game um when perhaps did we did we necessarily deserve it that's probably up for a little bit of debate but you've got to take the positive out of it in the fact that we did find a way back into the game we forced the goal you know this isn't a case of you know, it's not a freak goal. We forced that in because because Bundu is stronger at the back post than the man he was with. Um, it's no coincidence that the goal came from a corner that we actually put in with a bit of pace. I think these lofted corners over the top are a complete wasted exercise. Um, we need to be getting the corners in with a bit more um, gusto behind them, if you like. But then the frustrating thing for me is that we then didn't fashion another chance. Um, I had hopes that once we got back into it, that we might be able to fashion one more opportunity to go and win it. We didn't. Um, that's a bit frustrating. But look, after all the upheaval of the last week, and it has been upheaval, you know, the fan base have rejoiced. I didn't necessarily want to rejoice in the sacking of a of a manager. I don't think I've ever rejoiced in the sacking of a manager um, because of the human aspect of it. But there has been upheaval. And I think if you'd said to us at the start of that, we got four points from those two games, deep down, we probably would have said, we'll take that. Now, it's been made worse by the results that that happened around us over the, the last couple of games. And there's nothing we can do about that. There's absolutely nothing we can do about that. We've just got to do our bit. Um, and we're doing that slowly. Um, I'm going to come on to it later about what I think we need. And there is obviously something else I want to talk about, Aaron. There's a, a little segment that I do want to come on to. But, you know, overall, it was a frustrating evening. It wasn't the Rotherham performance, but I think that has to be expected because it was, you know, we're playing two polar opposite styles of play, aren't we? So you can't just rip one textbook up and go back to another. So um, it will take time. They've got, you know, it's not obviously going to come in the next... 48 hours it's going to be a tough night on Friday that we'll talk about later but um I certainly think going into that Stoke that run of Stoke and Millwall um those are the two games that you know you'd really got to look at I think from an Argyle point of view is is the ones that will tell us our fate Finn how are you feeling is your bowl of Kellogg's half empty or half full um, I, stole that. I stole that from someone I can't remember who. <laughs> yeah after last night so Directly after the final whistle last night, I felt quite um, down about it, really, because I didn't think that I was hoping that we'd come out with a bit more. Um, oh, it looks like Dan might be here. Uh, hoping that we we come out with uh, a bit more, you know, uh, vigor, I guess. Um, but to be honest, it, it was just a really nervy night. Both, you know, both sets of supporters, I feel like you could feel it. Um, and I didn't particularly enjoy the, the 90 minutes because I don't think we played particularly well. But I, I also think, um, you know, th that the positives are so we got four points in two games, and that's more than we've got in like the last. I'd got you know, I've forgot how many games you lost in a row in the first about it feels like a long time since we got four points in a, in in two games, you know, in a week. And I think um looking at that, you know, we're in a point in the season where performances don't really matter. It's all about results. You know, so actually to get that point last night, I think you are, I think EPR under under Sif uh, look a, a really organized outfit and, and stuff like that. Um, there's one thing I want to touch on what about what Joe said, and I think I wanted to kind of touch on it generally. For for, for their goal, and it's something I've noticed for, for a while, Ashley Phillips, um, people think that because he's a big man, um, he should be winning um, things in the air. He's not very good at winning things in the air. And I think that was maybe touched on in the podcast you did with that Blackburn fan before uh, he played for us. He just said, actually, he's not... He's not that great in the end. I don't think it's a lack of desire, a uh, lack of desire in terms of like Phyllis wanting to get there, you know, before uh, before the QPR player. I genuinely think like he's just not like very good at it. And someone, I saw a comment there where it said, uh, where, where, um, from a 
subscriber that said uh, that we were putting Ashley Phillips forward for goal kicks, much like um, they were doing for Dunn, uh, like, uh, their player Dunn last night. Uh, he was going forward and winning flick-ons, and that was quite effective for them. We shouldn't be doing that with Ashley Phillips because he might be six foot five, but he can't win headers. It's not his game. So, um, yeah, that's just a little tangent, but it's something I wanted to touch on. In general, uh, looking at it now, um, we're still not that pleased with the performance, but the point is all that matters. And look, it's a point closer to uh, towards uh, towards safety. So, yeah. Welcome, Dan. Standing in for Sam Down, quite literally. How's things? Yeah, good. Well, I wanted to get into character. So I thought I'd, you know, as Sam's replacement, I thought I'd A, stand up and B, turn up 10 minutes late. So I think I'm doing pretty well so far. Yeah, you've absolutely now I just that well. Yeah, now I need, need to just make some, you know, overreactionary, over the top opinions about things. And yeah, I've got the hat trick then, haven't I? Well, I think you've already got the hat trick in the fact that you've got no furniture. Um, yeah. Well. yeah, yeah, and some standing up. Yeah. Any 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 famous neighbours that we should know about in your new flat? Um, I couldn't possibly comment. There may be maybe an Argyle player that uh, lives in the same block of apartments as me, but for his sake, I won't name him. <laughs> Whilst we're on, um, whilst we're on um, QPR thoughts, you you seem to have seen you seem to have seen that game slightly different to most in the group chat last night. Do you want to run us through your initial thoughts? Yeah, of course. Um, look, I'm I'm not going to go too madly over the top and say it was absolutely incredible and you know we're back to our best and all that stuff, but. It was just so refreshing to see a bit of excitement back at home park for the first time in, well, I think since the Coventry game, really, you know, it's after all the disappointing games without scoring. And I know we were up against some quality teams and it was difficult, but, you know, we, it was a lot of the time, it was just dull, not just the fact we were losing without scoring. It was such dull, static football. And to see a bit of... Um, a little bit of kind of some of that stuff that we saw of the excitement earlier in the season. I know that, you know, we, we didn't create perhaps as much. We had spells in the game where we were poor. Hardy looks tired. Um, and and we, and in the end, had to rely on an own goal. But it was just nice to see, you know, some movement off the ball, some interchange, some some overlapping from the centre-backs. Like they mentioned Phillips going up the top and we also, um, the chance that Whitaker put wide first half came from a Phillips overlap down the right. We saw Ben, uh, done it again, two pods in a row. Lewis Gibson get to the left touchline, um, left byline and, and put a cross in, you know, just creating overloads and things like that. We just look more fluid. Yes, that meant that QPR created more chances than they might have done had we been a bit more compact and a bit more... Um, solid in our setup without you know interchanging and stuff but as a neutral it's so much better to watch and as a you know as an archival fan it's, it's better to watch and we got a point out of it would we have got a point under Ian Foster who knows but um it's it's it was better I think um I think the goal was a reward for our efforts throughout the game you could argue that QPR deserved to win with some of the chances they had, that that sitter that they had, which, um, you know, Cooper makes himself big. But I think at the end of the day, it's just a poor finish, smashed straight at him from point blank range. Um, and the Dan Scar header off the line as well. They really could have scored more than one. But, you know, it, as Finn said, it's, it's points over performances at this stage of the season. And I think we can be encouraged by the fact that we've managed to keep a bit of momentum going post Foster as two unbeaten. Um, yes, it's only Rotherham away in QPR at home. I know those are um, two of the toughest fixtures we'll have in this league, but um, it, was, it was just critical that after the sacking last week, we there was a lot of kind of feel-good stuff around the club, you know, players smiling in training again and, you know, fresh new start and now we can really have a go at staying up. It was critical to get some results off the back of that. So to get the win at Rotherham, to get the point last night, Leicester will be very, very tough, of course, but that gives us a bit of a springboard for the last four games, I think, and we can have a real good go at staying up. Yeah, Dan, I'm going to I'm gonna stick with you on that. Obviously, um, Joe's got a lot to talk about tonight and I'm sure we'll get to Finn in a second, but... Um, for me, we still look quite similar to that, the football under Ian Foster. 
Uh, would you say it's time to ditch that back five and get an extra man up between that midfield and, and Hardy, who looks quite isolated? Well, I think a, a big issue with the way we played under Foster was obviously the 3-4-3 with the two wide men, um, let's say normally like Whitaker and Devine, would stay really wide and basically be on the toes of the wing backs. So they'd be really, really close to each other. Um, and then, you know, of course that's going to leave Ryan Hardy really isolated. He's got the entire length of the pitch to try and, you know, to try and, you know, just play on his own. And, you know, teams would double or even triple up on him. Of course he's going to be isolated. I think an extra man in midfield is useful, but when those tens play narrower, let the wing backs provide the width. And we saw that at times last night with Whitaker drive, kind of drifting inside century. Um, Callum Wright to an extent as well. That's when they can support a support Hardy if we go long up to him, um, and b create that box four in midfield where we can outnumber teams as well. So I'm not necessarily sure that we should, you know, just ditch the three at the back and then and to try and get an extra man in midfield that way. Um, I think it can work. Um, this three four three, like I say, just put the wide men a little bit narrower, as we saw at times last night, and then I think we'll we'll profit from it. I think, like I said, there's just so much more movement off the ball. Yes, you you know, you always want more. You always want more kind of fluidity and chance creation and stuff like that. But I think the way we were interchanging and creating overloads at times yesterday is something we just didn't see under Ian Foster. Maybe I'm being, you know, um, revising what happened. I know we did have some good performances um, under Foster for sure, but the, the style of football for me is immediately much better now that he's gone. Yeah, I will get on to... Um, I've been quite busy at work, so I've not really prepared a lot. So we'll get on to the social questions um, in a minute. Just some full-time thoughts. Um, Curio Wells, we'll go with that. Uh, never going to start playing amazingly just because the manager left. Long old slog ahead. Um, I mean, there's only four games. It can't be that long. I hope. Anyway, um, Andrew, how about this for Friday? Bundu to start over Hardy. Um, he's his, he's he's his, at his best coming off the bench. Uh, drop Ben Wayne altogether and get Freddie Asaka back in the squad. There's a lot of call cool, uh, for Freddie again. We'll get onto that when we get into the uh, Leicester uh, preview. Um, the green wave, I can't see us being good enough to stay up as hard as they try. I just can't see it. Um Ryan, I'm not. I'm not usually. I'm usually a negative person, and that will continue tonight. I've seen nothing to say that we're staying up. I can post all the motivational videos you want, but they don't translate to wins. I'm sure we'll get onto some of the um, the pre-game media um, in a bit. Uh, Barry Evans, a valuable point, although we weren't great. Hardy isolated. Um, if this is because we keep going backwards rather than forwards, let's hope let's to have another nightmare on Friday. A lot of the uh, the full-time thoughts are more about the general. Um, feeling of, of the somewhat pending relegation rather than the game itself. Um, moving on to the social questions, which I've missed. Finn, um, the crazy pilgrim. I know he's in here tonight. Uh, for all the positivity and PR recently, did we see a real difference last night? Uh, for the large parts of that game, we were lost for ideas. Flat, as at JM underscore Bell 95 called it. Um Obviously, Dan sort of already answered that, but how, how did you how did you find it last night, Finn? Uh, I think we struggled to break them down. I, I would agree with Dan that um, we w the play in wide areas, in particular, were, was a lot quicker and, and better, and then the interchanges and work. Mumba got into some really good positions um, last night. Um, but in terms of, I think we if, under Cifuentes the. QPR's defensive record has actually been very good. Um, and um, like Joe said earlier, they did a very similar job to what West Brom um, did um, on us. So I think, yeah, probably it, 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 it I can't dress it up to be, you know, I, I said it, it wasn't great. I didn't particularly enjoy it. Um, but you've got to give QPR some credit and, they're in a sticky position now because the yes, SNO on 47 points after last night, but their last five games are absolutely horrible, probably pretty much as bad as you could you could uh you could hope for for a combination of games. Um so um 
they they've had uh, a, you know a couple of poor games um, in terms of results for them, but I think in general in the last few weeks, you know that they, they look like the first team that was initially in that kind of mix for relegation to actually sort of they they might be the ones to get out of it. So I think they they they've really improved on them and. Um, I think you know we we can't we can't just because Foster is gone you know there is there there is cracks that have been there for since Schumacher left because Schumacher you know because because of this sort of seismic wave that uh, Schumacher leaving created um, and then and then a really poor managerial appointment the I, the team haven't really had time to really get together and like you know really sort of process that I guess and and then. And then, so I, I can't this with too much, but yeah, it was flat. And I, and I, I don't know. I, I guess, I guess, I guess, yes, it was flat. But at the same time, like I said, a point's a point, and it w- was better than Foster. Looking back on it, last night when QPR went one, uh, one nil up, I just was raging. But you know, that was <laughs> that's medium reactionary, I guess. Yeah. Um... Joe, no, actually, I'm going to go back to Dan because Joe, you've got the big one next. Um, James Smith, Dan, has asked, question for the pod. Why are we all so negative when it clearly doesn't help anyone? The way I see it, we are on a two-game unbeaten streak after scoring at home for the first time in forever. Are we Are we potentially looking at, I mean, maybe, maybe you aren't because you seemed, like you said earlier, fairly positive about it, but... Do you, do you think collectively we're maybe looking at this the wrong way? It's actually, you know, if you offered us four points at the beginning of the week, most of us were taking them. Well, absolutely we would. And, and I, I agree with what you said, but I also understand the, the fans' frustration where we were nine points clear of the drop zone, um, you know, a good past halfway through the season. And then all of a sudden we, we've been dragged right into a relegation battle. It's It's frustrating that, all of the brilliant work that we've done over the last couple of years is potentially going to have been undone um, by a few months of, of really poor football and really poor results. So it's I, I do get the fans' frustration, even though I don't share as much of it as, as some people do. Um, look, it's I can't see it not going to the wire, to be honest. I, I A lot of people seem to be kind of saying with absolute, you know, saying definitively we're definitely going down or, or a few people say we're definitely staying up. I I really don't know. I can't see it anything other than going to the final day, to be honest. And 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 who knows when the music stops, to be, to be honest. Um, it's, it, it, it is very frustrating. But I think, like I said, that feeling of momentum and, and positivity that came after the sacking of Foster, rightly or wrongly, like the bloke or think he was terrible or think he was harshly treated whatever we've got to try and kind of just keep that and just try and get over the line I think um last season and not to do any you know disrespect to the performances which were which were excellent as well but those last five or six games which we won all of them it was just such kind of we had the momentum and we were just going to keep going at it you feel like we could play anyone in the league including Ipswich and we'd just win you know and I think that Obviously, with the step up and the um, step up in division, step up in quality is so much more difficult. But if we can just keep that going, even if we lose against Leicester, if we, you know, narrowly lose as opposed to getting pumped, I think that will just keep the momentum a little bit. And then we go into Stoke and get a result there. It just keeps it going. Had we lost last night or had we not beaten Rotherham, I think that post Foster momentum would have been not wiped, but a huge chunk would have just gone and the feeling of malaise would have been back in and we would have been in or very close to the relegation zone. And, you know, I think we've just got to try and keep harnessing that. Um, The players, given how many people have said it, clearly weren't happy under Foster. Um, And so once he goes there's inevitably going to be a you know fresh start let's let's go again we're we're happier again now type thing they've got to try and just keep that going yeah i don't know if there's much else to really cover on qpr itself there's a few questions about um recruitment and and giving hardy a rest and we'll, we'll do that whilst when we talk about leicester 
Um, unless anybody's got anything specific they want to cover on QPR, the QPR game first. Any any standouts, any positives, any players you want to rave about? No? Okay. Question then, social question. I've got a, a, a private DM from a, a, a Joe Bell. It says, um, so I'm two minutes into the chairman's update video. Wow. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I thought we were going into Ref Watch. Oh, yeah, go on then. Do, do, do Ref Watch. Over, and then to, just do Ref Watch. And How then could you up. miss out Ref Watch, Aaron? Uh, do, you not have a, do you not have a running order? Yeah, I do, but I've, I've literally finished work about 20 minutes ago. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. Um, anyway, moving swiftly on. Uh, just a couple of bits, really. Um, and it's all comical stuff, to be honest with you. Um, some of the poorest throw-in decisions one has ever seen at home park i mean utterly utterly abysmal on both sides of the pitch um there was one in front of me in the mayflower where um the fullback has quite clearly rifled it into the advertising boards with two argo players within no no less than a foot of him and the linesman's given it to qpr um just utterly appalling in that respect. And then the two other decisions I want to talk about is, number one, anybody in the comments, and we've got over 500 people watching so far, anyone in the comments, please send in a reason to me why Ashley Phillips escaped a yellow card for the most blatant and deliberate handball I have ever seen. Probably more deliberate than the one that Daniel Ayala got sent off for for Rotherham. I mean, it was awful. What about Zach yeah. Ruddens, like, ages ago? But he ends up on the floor and almost drags it back into his chest. He's, he's stopped it. It's a great save. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awful decision by the referee. Um, and this just shows that I am, you know, I'm I happy to berate referees when it even goes for us. Um, and the second one is, is I put it out on Twitter today, and I, I said it on my walk home from the ground last night, I think the decision to award the free kick on the 95th minute is one of the worst of the season. Um, Morgan Whitaker is halfway through his turn to goal. He's, you know, he's either got a chance to pull a trigger or Adam Forshaw is already committed to a run that could see him in space and there is a player further wide than him. Um, Whitaker is either turning and shooting which he has a bloody good chance of hitting the target on, or he's laying it off to somebody. I think the decision to award the free kick is awful from the referee. He was so quick to give it. And actually, that was the quickest decision he gave all night because every other decision that was made on the night seems to be made by committee. Um, and, you know, it, it it's just a really frustrating um, incident that, could have led to something. And I think probably my my um, animosity towards that decision is by the fact that actually the free kick was really poor. Um, we spent long enough trying to decide what we were going to do with it. Dan Scar was obviously shit housing in front of Asmir Begovic. Um, and in the end, we just stick it straight down Begovic's throat. Um, like he didn't even have to move for it. So perhaps that's why I'm a little bit negative. But honestly, those of you in the comments, A, why was Ashley Phillips not booked? at least booked, it's probably borderline the wrong shade of colour, if I'm honest with you, because it is so blatant and deliberate. Um, and the second one is just go back and look at that incident on 95 minutes because um, where Whitaker picks up the ball is, it, it boggles my mind that the referee stopped the play as quickly as he did. The other one I'd, I'd say, Joe, and I don't know your thoughts on this, is um, I couldn't believe Ballymumba didn't get booked for stopping a blatantly kind of they they wanted to take a quick throw in which looked like to kind of lead to a counter-attack and Mumba just blocks them from throwing it um that to me also is just absolute slam dunk nailed on 100 percent. you got a book in for it for all the terrible decisions and you're right he did give qpr a lot of awful decisions last night he then doesn't give us doesn't give us those two yellow cards as a bit of a well thank you very much his payback also be interested i mean you're never going to see it but I'd also oh, dan's fallen over um i'd also be interested to read the referees report as to what lyndon dykes received a yellow card for in the first half um it looked to me like he received a yellow card for an elbow 
Um, and my feeling is if you're elbowing a player that there's probably the wrong colour card. I don't understand where a mitigating factor for that is. Um, you know, if you've raised your arm to somebody, it's a red card. There's no um, factors to that. But that's enough of ref watch, Aaron. I think you've got something else you want me to waffle on about. Yeah, go on. Go straight into it. Obviously, um, I keep wanting to say midweek. It felt like it was a, a Friday night game. I got used to those after one trip to Rotherham. Um, oh, and good Friday. No, actually. Um, obviously, two. you said you were two minutes in to the chairman's update video. And wow, and that I have to ask you about it tomorrow. So tomorrow is today and I'm asking you about it. What would you make of it? Uh, yeah, wow is the word. Um, I didn't expect what we were told by the chairman. Um, first of all, um, you know, it obviously appears now that he's not been in the country due to um, some health health issues. He's obviously had to have clearance from a doctor before he came over. So that would obviously explain the absence that I was um, perhaps bemoaning or even criticising for. So Simon, if you are watching, I apologise. Um, also, if you are watching, I don't know why you're watching because there's other several important games going on and you can always catch this another time on YouTube X or Facebook once we finish recording. Um, but the the main points of this really are he's honest. It would seem to me like he is honest. Um, first of all, that's all one can ask of their chairman. Um, but he sort of doubles down on what appears to be quite a serious character assassination of Ian Foster that's been going on over the last week to 10 days, um, which really did take me back a little bit. Um, he goes on to say that he hopes in future that they will be friends and they can move on. And, you know, let's, let's hope that happens um, because, you know, you never like to see that. And he is a young man, as I say, he's a young coach trying to, to make a way into the game. Um, but there were a few irregularities that I picked up on in the interviews. Um, and I just need to bring up the my notes on the Chris Arrington interview that he gave to the Herald as well. Um, and a few of the ir irregularities, he, he goes on in the Argo TV interview with Charlie Price, which is excellent, that, um, you know, it's important that we stay in the championship and, you know, survival is is massive and it's for the five-year plan and it's for all the infrastructure projects well the infrastructure projects were announced pre-christmas the five-year plan was announced pre-christmas and i was at that last fans forum pre-christmas when i was told well if we go down it's not the end of the world but now all of a sudden it is the end of the world but it wasn't the end of the world when we were 16th in the championship so other than our league position changing what else has changed for it to suddenly become we have to stay up there's absolutely no going down we must stay up um, he then goes on to touch in the Chris Arrington interview um, that he feels that Ian, in hindsight, was in a very difficult position. I think the position was probably worse than we thought it was and that in the first half of the season, we out-resulted our performances. Um, yeah, perhaps that is true. And I made a point the other week that, or the other day when we were on the... Um, when we were on the sacking pod that I felt for Ian Foster because I felt you know, essentially the club had left him short personnel wise. It took him ages to get support staff in. We hadn't really helped him. Um, there was then this Andrew Parkinson's statement that said that Ian Foster had free reign in the transfer window to bring in who he had. And we brought in a load of kids on loan. Well, that's probably a conversation for the summer. I sort of want to park the whole recruitment conversation if we can until the end of the season. Um, and then the big one that I really was drawn on with the Simon Hallett thing was Chris Owens asked him, when did you realise you might need to make a change of manager slash head coach? And he said, about a week before we did. We kind of talked about it during the international break. People said we should have done it during the international break. This Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday routine of games makes making changes very difficult because you break the training routine and that can cause even more problems. But if you're doing it in a two week break, there is no Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday routine. The players were given a week off. You could have made the change after Preston and Jusnip and Nanske would have had two weeks to rally the troops and to get behind them. Like, I don't quite understand that. And 
I know, look, he goes on to say that he doesn't want to be giving in to baying supporters. And I, I get that, you know, he's he's invested a lot of his own money and he's entitled to, he's, at the end of the day, he calls the shots. People were having to go at Neil Jusnip saying that, oh, Neil's made, Neil's made this appointment, this is his friend and everything. But hang on a minute, Simon Hallett would have had to have signed off that appointment. It wouldn't have come solely from Neil Jusnip. So everybody is involved in, in what went on in the last three months. Um, but these are all conversations for another day. It was refreshing to hear him come out and give the interview. Um, it still begs the question as to why there wasn't anything in support of Ian Foster, particularly after that Preston game, before the not before that Easter weekend, because Hallett essentially said in the interview that we've got we'd made the decision that if it goes badly over the next two games, but if they'd come out and supported their head coach and said, you know, we are we're right behind you. I'm not saying it would have made a difference. And we all know that it would have been the proverbial vote of confidence, etc. But I don't know. There's a few irregularities in there. It was refreshing to hear from him. Um, you know, we, we're going to have a big end of season pod, aren't we, Aaron, at the end, where we're going to talk about everything that's gone on and we're going to look at look forward to the new manager and, and all of that side of things. Um, but he sort of also mentions that all of this week there are key meetings that are going on and there are going to be several, I think, tough meetings that might be going on behind the scenes at Argo because there's been a, there's been some clear breakdowns um in what's gone on um you know it's obviously not worked out for a number of reasons you know the players were, were clearly unhappy that's absolutely not a secret anymore um so that needs to be looked at we need to make sure there's a strong link between the dressing room and the board he also mentions about investment. There are two irons in the fire, if you like. One that seems like a strong possibility, one that he was getting briefed on on Tuesday. Um, like, why is the chairman... I do, as a layman, if you like, not knowing totally how football clubs operate and things, why is the chairman having to be briefed on an investment opportunity? Surely it goes through him, I would guess, as the majority shareholder. Um, so I'd like to know about that. But look, there's a number of comments coming in. And, you know, of course, fans are entitled to voice their opinion. And I, I think, you know, Andrew Parkinson was quite open and transparent with everything. He, he said as much as he could do, I think, in his statement. And he said that, you know, they do listen to um, the fans' opinions. And of course, they're important. But at the end of the day, this is a, you know, you've got to remember, this is a really big decision that they would have had to have made um with everything on the line so i appreciate the interview i do think there are still a couple of questions that need answering um but look this is as i said last week we've just got to park this chapter for the next month by all means we can revisit it at the end of the season when we dissect the season um but you know without using a cliche we just got to focus on the next game and it's coming up quickly yeah, that's that's an excellent penalty from former Exeter man Matt Grimes. Um, and Joe, that was, him. that was exactly the reason why I didn't come to you on the social questions. Um, you feel quite a bit of time there. Um, Finn, obviously, there's some there's been some criticism. It, it, it does feel like everybody at the club's trying to save face a little bit, you know, post right. sacking. Very quickly, that was the one point I was thinking about as I was waffling that I couldn't remember that I wanted to say. Um, and you are, I'm just going to jump in before Finn says it. That's exactly what it comes across as. With everything that's gone on in the media, it sort of seems like the buck's trying to be passed a little bit, and I'm not totally sure I'm all for that as a supporter. Um, there's absolutely no problem at all in admitting that things went wrong and everybody is complicit in a mistake. Mm. Um, to sort of pass the buck onto one person when there was a whole heap of turmoil before Christmas caused by another person, everybody, and then you've got the month of January that was just a what looks now to be an enormous mistake um, with how things panned out, everybody is complicit in what happens. From the top to the bottom, everybody is going to be complicit in what the final outcome is going to be. It's not just solely on Ian Foster. And whilst everyone is entitled to their opinion, I do feel like we have to get away from that narrative because everybody 
will have played a part in some small way in this. And, and on that, Finn, what are you? What's your opinion? <laughs> um, obviously, as as we mentioned, it does feel like everybody's trying to sort of save face, but and chucking faster. On yeah, the I, I I kind of agree with uh, with Joe. To be honest, um, look, I think I'm going to be careful what I say here, but. I think Hallett has conducted himself pretty poorly over the last month or so, particularly when you um, when you consider, you know, he, he he's he, he's always been oh, how tra- how um, transparent aren't we? Like you know, and how, you know how good are we at like you know he's got so much praise from people like Kerry Maguire and all of these media. Uh, people on, on on Twitter, football, how well he runs the club. Yeah, so and to be honest, I know that we had Derek Adams and and that went poorly towards the end. But he was a very good manager for Plymouth Argyle. So really, in his tenure, this is the first time that he's come under sort of any fire in terms of his um his questioning. Because even though we could look back in hindsight and go well, he should have sacked Adams earlier. You know, Adams basically changed, you could argue Adams changed the fortunes of the of the club around. You know, he started the positive momentum for this club. So this is, for me, the first real time where his uh, sort of actions and the board's actions have been put into question. And he's kind of gone hiding. I know he's done an interview, but, I, but yeah, he's kind of not, I, I, you know, and Neil Dewsnip, you know, both of them, he would think would be key in in the decision making have kind of gone well yeah it's just a shame it it's... um yes my inner cardiff fan is now coming out come on um but uh sorry yes um <laughs> yes his uh oh, my, thank my, your my pardon completely gone um but yes i i think Basically, I think, yeah, I think it's it's kind of been like, oh, it's just a bit of a shame, uh, but they haven't actually really, and maybe maybe they will behind closed doors, but the impression I'm getting is that they are not really taking responsibility to see themselves and see it a bit more of a consequence of that we were overperforming earlier in the season, when actually, um, well, you only have to look at the last two results, yes, against QPR and Rotherham, to say, like, this team can compete at this level and for six, seven weeks, we basically won. So, you know, there's there's something in their decision-making then, oh, it just hasn't worked out. I know everybody makes mistakes, but it's like you are the senior, you know, you are the senior executives at this club and and, and ultimately the, 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 buck, the buck stops with you. So I feel, yeah, I feel a bit disappointed in that. I, I think ultimately... Um, we're going to have to talk of digest it more on the end of season pod, whether we know after we know whether we've gone down or not. Because clearly, if we stay up, which I really, really, really hope we do, then you know everyone can just forget about it. I guess you know that everyone will just be like, oh, okay, let's move on. Whereas you know, if we go down, it will very much be the topic of, of the day. So they are running the danger of coming under under massive fire here. But I suppose. Until we know the result of the season, well, I just hope we can put behind some of our sort of questions and kind of, you know, get behind the team, which I think the fans have been doing. And I think the team, uh, yeah, there's no lack of effort there. One thing I did chuckle at um, very quickly was Hallett mentioned in his Herald interview with Chris Errington that... Um, you know, we've all got short something like we've all got short memories. Ian Foster was up for manager of the month in January. Well, you look back on it now. Yes, we got a good result at home against Cardiff, which was probably the best performance under Foster in just his second league game in charge. The other one was a point away at Huddersfield, which there was nothing in the game, and probably on reflection now it looks like a really disappointing result. So, you know, there is that and I think I can't remember if the EFL even chucked in the one, the three all draw with Watford as one of the results to put him forward as manager of the month or not. I hope they didn't. Um, but to use that as a benchmark was a little bit poor in my mind. I mean, 
you know, he is still the best head coach that this club has ever had. And so far, and hopefully will uh, will ever have. Uh, hopefully the next person that comes in is a, is a manager of a bit of experience. Uh, Dan, last one on the on the comments then. Obviously, um, quite a few people have mentioned it. Hallett's, um, you know, comments on delaying the decision um, post-Preston. He said to Errington, look, I'm an investment guy. You become a good investment guy by being contrarian. It makes you dig your feet in a little bit more, particularly when that tiny minority of fans were being so abusive, I'm sorry, but it makes us less likely to make the change that they're demanding. Um, a lot of people have interpreted that, uh, maybe including myself, that they don't listen to fan pressure. It's not not a great look, is it? I don't really have a lot to say on this. Um Oh, I coming. think that <laughs> we'll move on. Um, I, he's obviously picked his time to to say this and say that he wasn't happy with what you know the, some of the some of the fan comments. Which um, you know, had he said these things when before making that decision when Foster was still in charge, well, he just wouldn't say it because there would be absolute hell. I I just think he's it's it's a very brave game to ever you know attack your own customers customers always right and all that stuff i but as passionate as sport as football is some of the stuff bandied around social media and 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 comments and things are yeah are over the, are, are over the top and and wide of the mark I wanted Ian Foster sacked. Don't like saying that I, you know, wanted to see a man lose his job. But at the end of the day, because he was quite clearly a terrible tactician, um, and, and and we were losing games pretty much every single week. Sorry, I wanted the guy sacked. You know, um, when you're seeing stuff on social media, you know, wishing harm on the bloke, physical harm on the bloke, I can understand why. Hallett felt the need to come out and say that's too far, you know. Um, so I think it's it's just remembering that you know we can, well, in my eyes anyway. You know, other people might see it differently and have different morals, but at the end of the day, in my eyes, I think that you can want the guy, you can want to see Argyle make a change. You can say that you know this person isn't up to this standard and this person isn't up to this standard without it going too far. Um, I saw a comment just come in and say, you know, who got abused? I saw a comment and I have to admit, reported a comment on social media, wishing physical harmony in Foster. Sorry, you know, that's, that to me is too far, you know, like, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It's, it's just, it's, it's not on. And I think that's probably where Hallett was coming from. Yeah, that's fair enough. He does also say tiny minority. So, um, agreed. Where have my notes gone flipping about here? Should we move on to Leicester? There's nothing I haven't missed off your precious running order, is there, Joe? No, very good. Obviously, the, the final four, we've already asked people on socials. Leicester at home, Stoke City away, Millwall away, Hull City at home. Uh, how do we fare in those, Finn? After last night, I said I, I struggle to see us getting a win. Um, but I do think we can get a win. Do you know what I mean? I, I think it's going to be a slog. Whatever happens, it'll be a slog. Um, I don't see us. I, I'm not nervous at all, despite our position. I'm not nervous at all for the for the for the game um, against Leicester on Friday. That has always been a free hit. Whatever position we were we were in this this season, that game against Leicester was always a free hit. I'm hoping that we can go out there and give it a best shot, knowing there's a free here. I think part of the performance was up from our team, as I kind of mentioned earlier, was last night was was because everyone knew the, the ramifications of it. So I'm, I'm, there's no pressure from anyone, despite our position on Friday. And I, I think maybe if we can get something out of that, just a point or whatever, uh, it'd be a bonus. Even if it's a 1-0 loss, you know, goal difference comes into it at this point in the season. And currently we've got very uh, good goal difference compared to everyone else around us. So that's an extra point if you look at it that way. 
Um, I do think our best chances of a win will come against Stoke and Millwall. So those probably Millwall being the one, I think, because I think either someone's going to get it completely tactically wrong at Stoke and one team's going to win 3-0 or it's going to be completely cancelled out because you couldn't have two people that know more in Juice Nip and Schumacher about each other and their football footballing uh, principles. So, um, yeah, I think we, we, we can stay up and I do think we can get a win. However, I don't... I, I think we're more likely to get three draws than we are to get a win is what I think. Dan? Final four? Oh, blimey. <laughs> it's going to be, yeah, like I said, it's going to be so, so tight, isn't it? I think, am, am I right in saying that, um, so Birmingham are losing, is that, am I seeing that um, coming in? Birmingham are so, losing. So, as it, as it stands, all three results are going our way. Right. Okay. So if we do get one more win, I believe that is now, that now means that Birmingham would need to get, I think, because they're three behind us there. So they need seven points from their last four games um, to, to overtake us, which is obviously very possible, but you're kind of starting to think, well, that's, that's starting to look unlikely, isn't it? You know, we could all, nearly get to the stage where they're probably not going to catch us. But there's just so many permutations still. I think it's a difficult one to to try and work out, you know, how many points we're going to need until probably probably after the Stoke game. Um, it's, yeah, who knows the Leicester game? I mean, go back a couple of months and I would have absolutely said... Um, yeah, it's a you know they they could easily do what Leeds did, turn up, steamroller us. You know, there's nothing we can do, even if we play to the best of our abilities. But it's just, I, what has happened to them? They've been so inconsistent. I mean, they're somehow still top of the league, aren't they? Or are are Ipswich winning, which puts them, uh, which puts them off the top? But it's just, yeah, it's incredible how they're still in the promotion shakeup, really, given how poor they've been for so long. So it does make you think. Well. If Millwall can do them, why not us? You know, um, it's a really interesting dilemma, I think, in that, like I say, I think Hardy needs a rest and, and whether we perhaps play like a 3-5-2 and play Whitaker just off Bundu, whether we start Ben Wayne, I, I, I don't know. Um, but you feel like Hardy probably needs a game where he doesn't start and Friday feels the most appropriate given it's Stoke and Millwall coming up. Um yeah, <laughs> flip a coin. That's kind of how I feel about, yeah, whether we're going to stay up or not. It's going to be so, so tight. So you're in the Sam Down role completely of the 50-50, but edging towards going down, which is... Yes, quote, quote Sam Down, I'm on the fence, 50-50, but I think we'll go down. <laughs> he did actually say in the chat last night, incredibly precise numbers. I should be proud as an accountant, but it's incredibly... Got to be precise numbers. I'm between 53 and 55 percent sure that we're going to go down. <laughs> How can you argue with that? Absolutely class. Um, Joe, Dan's touched on Leicester's form, obviously away from home. They've, they've won one and drawn one in the last five. At home, we've drawn one in the last six. Um, it's got the makings of an absolutely cracking game of Sky, this, isn't it? It's got nil nil written all over it. Yeah, um, just quickly on the, the point the two lads have, have made there on, on what's going to be needed and, and points tallies and things. Um, my gut feeling is, particularly given how the Birmingham City game's going at the moment, I made the point last night, I can't see Birmingham City or Huddersfield, just those two alone, getting to more than 48 points. I cannot see a way that that happens. Now, I know that Birmingham still have to play Huddersfield and Rotherham in back-to-back -back games, but if they don't get a win against Rotherham in that first of those two games, that Huddersfield game all of a sudden becomes one of the biggest games in Birmingham's recent history. So, particularly with the new investment they've had. Um, so that's the way I look at it, is I don't think that those two teams can get to 48 points. If they do get to 48 points, I don't see them getting to 49 with what's left. 
Now, we're on 45. Do I see us getting to 48 points? Yes, I do. Do I see us getting to 49 points? I probably think we will. And I actually think we could get to 50 because I think we're going to win one of our last four and we're going to draw two of them. Um, so I think if you look at it that way, if we can get ourselves to 49 with our goal difference, that providing we don't take an absolute pasting on Friday night is worth a point at least, then I think 49 may well end up being the magic figure. That's just my rough workings on, on the current situation. On to Leicester on Friday night, whether it's going to be a classic for Sky. Um, that depends of what persuasion you are, um, because I don't expect this to be a basketball match, if I'm being brutally honest. Mm. Um, we know what Leicester have got at their disposal. And without trying to go all Ian Foster on the 700 odd people who are currently tuning in, we have to know our level in this matchup. And our level is not Leicester's. Um, and with respect to that, whilst I'm not advocating throwing a game away and things, I would be looking at the Stoke game eight days later and thinking, right, how can I maximise my chance of getting three points there? And to do that, I'm going to be the most... I'm going to come up with the most absurd thing that's perhaps ever been put on a fan's podcast. All right. And this can be clipped up. It can be shared around any group chat you like. There is nothing that's going to get the crowd going more than a rear guard performance where every tackle, clearance, header, goal kick, everything is going to get everyone on their feet cheering and roaring behind them. I personally would go without a number nine in this game is the way I would approach it. I wouldn't play a striker. Now, whether or not you then play somebody up front in like a false nine, as the new football term is, is up to the coaching staff, I probably actually would, wouldn't play anyone up there. Um, I think you've got to try and flood the midfield as best you can. I think you've got to try whatever you can to stop Leicester getting anywhere near your box. You certainly can't allow them to play through us. You're going to have to make them play around us and hope that we can deal with anything that comes into our box. That's the one way I feel like we're going to have our best chance. And somewhere we're going to have to come up with something that Leicester aren't expecting. What that is, I don't know. But I would play as many in midfield as I could possibly fit in there Um and people are talking that they don't like Houghton, Randall and Forshaw being on the pitch at the same time. This is the game to do it. Um, you could probably, you know, you could play five across, the, five across the midfield. You could play bloody six across the midfield if you want to and really stifle Leicester. Um, but something needs to be done. And I am the biggest Ryan Hardy fan in the world. And I apologise to Sandra if she's still tuning in. Um, the moment where Hardy was played through last night and his touch took it out of play just about summed up to me where Hardy is at the moment a little bit he's exhausted he's he's just exhausted he needs a break um so I would and if you can take him out of the firing line for this game and have him ready completely ready for Stoke and Millwall I saw a comment earlier saying, has anybody noticed that Hardy's form tends to tail off at the end of the season? Well, I think that's because by this point, he's in exactly the position he's in now. He's done so much running and so much hard work that it gets to those last few games and it is difficult to go again. So I think you've got to maximise the chance of getting the best possible Ryan Hardy out on the pitch. And for me, that is, is that he doesn't start this game. Um, if you want to bring him off for 20, 25 minutes off the bench, that's fine. So be it. Um, but I think you've got to try and come up with a formula where he doesn't play. I do firmly believe in the whole false nine idea. So I would probably play. We did, we did similar with Cundall, right? Up at Leeds. I mean, we lost that game. So it didn't yeah. go that well. But and I mean, it worked. It worked all right. for If if my memory serves me right, which it often doesn't. Um, it worked well for the first half. Yeah. I mean, the front three I would play is probably Bundu, Wright and Whitaker. And I said it on the podcast last week about what Derek Adams used to do with his wide players, where he was constantly interchanging them. 
across the back line and it was leaving the opposition thinking, I'd be doing that. Every sort of 10, 15 minutes, right? If you're playing on the left, you're now in the centre. If you're in the centre, you're now on the left. If you're on the right, you're over there, that sort of thing. Just keep moving them around because I think they're capable of doing that. We saw Whitaker appeared on the left a number of times last night where he wasn't going for the last four months. So I think that's something we can look at. But look, they, they've got to come up with a, a different performance to what we saw last night. Because if we do put in the performance we did last night, unfortunately, we are probably going to end up taking a bit of a pasting on our goal difference. That's just my gut feeling. Um, so what they do, I don't know. But the only thing I would be advocating for seriously is that Hardy gets a rest and is fully charged up and ready to go for Stoke and Millwall. Yeah, I think we've eclipsed an hour now. We we wanted to keep it below an hour. We haven't. Um, so well done. Mainly Joe. Well done. Congratulations. Um, You're welcome. Anything you, anything you want to add on um, Leicester? I mean, you've covered all my questions about Hardy's tiredness and how we get on and how we get on at Leicester. Obviously, um, just do score predictions. Yeah, just just one thing. I, I I'd agree with Joe. I think if we're gonna Hardy needs a rest. I you know he is absolutely spent. And if we're gonna get anything out of him in the last final final four games, we it, this is the game where we can afford to rest him because it's the game we're least uh, likely to get a result in. Um, so so yes, I would I would rest Hardy for this game. In fact, I wouldn't. I want to see him have a proper rest where we send him off. Yeah, if we if we if we if we, if we, if we, if we could if we could get away with it, I would I would rest him for the full ninety minutes and say have the week off, come back after you know, play play against Stoke. Uh, I feel literally that's what he needs. Um, I think he seems to be. I don't know if it's if it's confirmed or not, but he seems to be carrying an injury. I think he he doesn't look. It's not just, you know. He, he, he's he's not uh, he's tired. I, I think he, he's not a hundred percent. So I really do think if we can get away with him, rest, uh, get away with resting him for a game, this is it. And we just need to, yeah. I wouldn't play Wayne. Well, I might play Wayne, but I I, I quite like the idea of a false nine where whoever that might be, whether it be Callum Wright or even I don't know. I don't know who you'd put there. Um, the other thing I would say is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, Sandra. Um, the um, the 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 other thing I would say, I know they're pressure games, but what's the what is the what is the harm in putting Freddie Asaka in the squad? He, he gives us another option off the bench, um, and we we need options, so I would do that as well. But that's the last thing I've got to say. I think um, if I'm going for a, a result um, on. On Friday, I think it's going to be 2 0 to Leicester. Dan? Yeah, I'd just say quickly that um, for all I was saying about, you know, it's nice to see more kind of committing bodies forward and overlapping and all that and all that stuff on uh, last night. Um, I would actually just basically, as Joe said, play a, a false nine, probably play Whitaker there because, you know, his defensive work rate doesn't quite stack up to some of those other wide men that we've got. Um, and just try and keep it as at nil nil for as long as we can. Um, the goal difference point has been made, and as negative and as defensive as it seems, um, if we get pasted five nil, and I, I don't think we would, but you know, if Leicester really turn it on, and if we're very try and play very aggressively, and they do paste us five nil, all of a sudden that goal difference is looking a bit less sure of being that extra point that we all talk about. It is so. Just keep it at nil-nil for as long as we can. We might still get edged out, but, you know, so be it. We might sneak a point. Um, and therefore, I think, yeah, Whitaker is a false nine. Um, the kind of two tens help play quite deep, help out the centre mids and create more numbers in there, as Joe said, almost like a, a three-six-one, if you like, rather than a three-four-three. Um, and then and see how, see how long we can frustrate them for. Um, I, I still think, to be honest, we will probably get edged. Um, but yeah, one one nil Leicester, um, and then we move on to the Stoke game, which is absolutely critical for our season. Yeah, I think for me, I just I just don't think we have the 
the ability in that midfield to to sit in and and be overly defensive. We've we've tried it a few times, and I think the only time it's really paid off was Leeds at home, and even then, maybe, you know, we maybe. Lost that one. I just don't think we've got the legs in the middle. If we need that midfield three, I don't think we've got anybody that's going to chase and harass and harry and. You know, I think the- he's been very hot and cold this season at the back, but maybe even putting Julio Pegasolo in there. Uh, mm. what, you know, he, he he came to the club, you know, being able to play uh, right back into the defensive midfield. I, I would I would give it a go, even break if break things up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that centre midfield role, do you reckon he could do? We I put in the group chat last night about Forshaw needing legs beside him. He's like a Sarsevich in beside him. Do you think Pegasolo could do that? I'm not sure he's quick enough. I, I think that uh, I know. I know the results weren't great, but I think the potential of a Forshaw and JB partnership, where you know JB has the legs and 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 Forshaw is the kind of more um, you know keep things ticking over and and play the sensible passes type thing, was a really well balanced two in midfield. It was just a shame that um, yeah we weren't we weren't set up to be to be particularly good. But I, I, I like that shout, Finn. I think, yeah, let's maybe drop Pleggy in there, maybe even alongside Houghton, just to kind of really protect the back three and the goalkeeper. Um, yeah, and and like I say, just it's it's not, I know that a lot of will say playing to our strengths is, you know, going forward and, and committing men forward and attacking and stuff. And certainly that is evidenced last night. But it's a different type of game against Leicester. You know, the, the quality teams in this league, Leicester leads Southampton. Um, you've you've got to take a bit of a different approach against them, I think. You've not, you've famously not named one of the top four there. You've done that deliberately. Well, um, I think I've named the top three teams <laughs> with the most quality in this league. You know, I'm having no, anyone no, else, can you? No, I appreciated it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, no worries. Good bit. Um, Joe, any last thoughts on, on Leicester? Score prediction? Right. Um, looking forward to seeing Robert Jones, the referee, back at Home Park after the Leeds game. Um, nice to have a bit of Premier League royalty, if you like, at you Home just Park. Love referees, don't you? Well, it gives me something to moan about, Aaron. To be honest, so not that I don't I'm think I've ever, I don't think I've met anybody as so obsessed with officials. Not that, I, not that I'm on after this weekend. So if he does have a shocker, somebody else will will have to take over. Um, I'm on <laughs> birthday drinks duty with a family. So, um, what are my thoughts on this one? Uh, look, I, I hope we can keep it as tight as possible. If we can nick one from a, a set piece while it is nil-nil, then absolutely fantastic because it gives us something to hold on to. Um, I, With Dan, I don't see us getting a pasting um, because I don't see... This is going to sound really stupid and blinkered a little bit, but looking at the goal difference bar leads, I don't actually see Leicester having a dire need to drastically improve their goal difference. Um, and it might get to the point of 2 nil even 3-0 and they might think, right, let's start, you know, they've got important games coming up themselves, so let's start taking the likes of Jewsbury Hall and, and players like that off. I can hope and dream. Uh, but I do think 2-0 is probably how this one will end. Um, you know, I, I think we'll keep it tight. I think we'll we'll work hard. Um, I'm confident of that, that they'll, they'll run through a brick wall if needed, but um, I just think there's going to be a, a huge, a huge gulf in class and quality. And look, I'm I'm prepared for that. I expect it. So um, the pressure's more. As there's a comment just coming in, Aaron. I don't know if you want to put it up from David. So the pressure's on in a weird way. Not that comment. Um, mm-hmm. In a weird way, the the pressure's you know it's on them immensely because their end goal is worth hundreds of millions, and they do have a points deduction hanging over them. Um, regardless of what division they're in. So they'll much rather have a point deduction in the Premier League than in this league. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big game at both ends of the table, but I do think there'll be a bit of um, bit of a quality difference, unfortunately. Yeah, I, actually, yeah, the more I think about it, the more we could could potentially frustrate them. We just need to go back to those, those um, Schumacher days of just every 10 minutes. When that, you know, keep it nil-nil first 10. 20. Who's up? For, who's up for a formation of six four nil? It'll be bloody six four nil. Um, if we, <laughs> we don't, don't keep our uh, wits about us. Um, obviously, before we go, a couple of uh, uh, most of the games in the championship are nearing nearing full time. I know that means they're not over, but nearing. Uh, Cardiff uh, are still winning, so that's that's brilliant for us. Blackburn are, 
a 5 0 down. Um, Hull are keeping their playoff push alive with a 2 2 draw against Middlesbrough. Um, and the only other one that really concerns us is obviously Stoke winning 3 0 at um, Stephen Schumacher's Stoke City. Um, he looks very tired. Stoke are winning 3 um, 0 at Stoke. Swansea. Have- they're all up there, aren't they? They're all up north. Um, Have Blackburn left it too late to make a change? Um, mm, just well, 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 I don't know you just could, though, because they, they've recently drawn with Southampton and beaten Sunderland 5-1. I mean, obviously, luckily, that five has been wiped off this... Uh, or that four has been wiped off uh, tonight. So that's just thinking, not, not that any of us are, but if I'm a, if I'm a Blackburn fan, I'm... Absolutely petrified at the end of that game tonight, personally. No, I just want to go back to Finn's earlier comment of his secret Cardiff City fan. Absolutely disgusting comment. Oh, yeah. I, well, my, my, my granddad is a Cardiff supporter, so I look out for their results. What can I say? Well, disgusting. We don't we don't like second teams here, Finn. Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, Joe, obviously... How, how, how did Norwich team. get on this evening? Uh, they didn't play this evening, mate. They played yesterday. Um, and you would know. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, Blackburn could make a change, I suppose, but there's no real, like, proven firefighter managers without a job in the Championship at the moment, is there, going spare, so none that we could pick up anyway. Um, Anyway, should we call it a night? Anyway, yes, let's do that. Remember to like um, and share and subscribe and do all that stuff um, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok. Um, you can subscribe to us on all major podcast apps. And now, also, forgot to mention, should have mentioned at the beginning, um, you can now get this podcast ad-free if you sign up to our Patreon. Um, a few people have already done that. Appreciate that. Need to add their names to this little ticker um, along the bottom. But you can get it ad-free because why not? Um, yeah, do that. All right. See you later. See you post Ipswich. We'll be back live uh, Sunday night. Post Ipswich. Ipswich. Leicester. <laughs> You said yeah, Ipswich, and you've got, and you've gone said Stoke twice in the same sense. Who says we're obsessed with Stoke and Ipswich on this pod? Honestly, honestly, you, if you think and, I can read, you are mistaken. And, Post and Sunday, Sunday on a, after a Friday game. Oh, Saturday then, whatever. Yes, Saturday night, um, like Wigfield, eight p.m. Bring back Stan. That's what I say. Who cares? I'll put our tweet out anyway. Cheers, guys. Ladies. Cheers, mate.